everybody. How's everybody doing out there? Trent, come on down. Hey. Grab hey, your good mic. morning, Dana. We're so excited that you guys are here this morning. It's sunny on out today. On this sunny, it was sunny freezing, day. But so nice out. So much weather we've had, right? So much weather. We, were you all out the yesterday at all? We, all we the drove weathers. out and saw snow. We went through out to North Bend. Yeah. And so out there over by the falls, you know? Yeah. Cars sitting out there were just cake covered with really? like two inches of snow. I got, I got zero snow at my house. It was house. crazy. And Not then we drove for like about five, like after we got left North Bend yeah. and we were headed more towards the city. Yeah. Roads were None. dry, sun was yeah. out, and yeah. it was like beautiful. Yeah, it was crazy. crazy. It was crazy weather, but this week, oh. like in the seventies, it's supposed to be this week. Yes, I'm so excited. Yes, my kids are gonna be so happy. Uh, you know, I'm happy for all those that are going off to like uh, Hawaii or something like that. I'm not this week. happy for them. I'm not because we still. No, that's <laughs> mean, I guess. no, I'm very happy for you if you get to go. No, if you get to do good that, good on you. Awesome, good but we're you. gonna have like Hawaii here in that's Duval right. This I know week. they're leaving on the nicest week of the year. I know traveling. it's gonna Jokes be good. On them. Hey, no, so we kidding. have we're happy for you. Fun today. We have a lot of fun today. We have. Some we had a special little bit too much fun earlier. Yes, even. We, so we'll it see got if that crazy. continues on I know, or not. We have to rein it in. <laughs> um, some special guests. You want to introduce who is here with us? I do want to. Okay. I do. We have. Uh, I should have thought of like an embarrassing story. Ooh, Why did I not think of that? No, nah, I got nothing. Nothing's coming. Uh, Cassie and Jesse Estrin, folks, Yay! come on down. Applause track. Yay! Morning. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome. You We're so have excited you're no here. No embarrassing stories of I'm me. I'm sure I do. None. I have known Jesse for years, like years. since he was in junior high, fourth grade, fifth grade, something yeah, like little, that. Little, little. So I back. I Nothing. Don't know. I'll have to think of some <laughs> and come back around with them. But I then nothing's coming right now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, he's Matt's over there. Not saying what he's my so wife perfect. says. That's false. Not what my wife says. Definitely not. Perfect. Not what your junior high youth leader says. No. Nope. So. Okay. Nope. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> bam, bam, bam. <laughs> maybe you'll get some sparked ideas. Let's do birthdays. Let's We're gonna do, do that first. Yes. Birthdays See that are coming up, comes. and maybe yes. some of those things will come into your mind. Okay. I think we did As we do, a do some of these. So together, remember, so. we are saying birthdays that are coming up this, this week. next week. Yes. So Dan is gonna do some kids. Hey, so Trig Van Tassel, happy birthday. To yeah, you, my little redhead friend, Evelina Thompson. Happy what? birthday! What did you say? He's my little redhead. Friend. Oh, redhead friend. Yeah, he cool. has red okay. hair. He, he and Happy his birthday, brother, redheads. His sister, they all have red hair, which is exactly how my family was. <laughs> Anyways, he knows what I'm. T happy birthday, Trig. Evelina Thompson. Happy birthday to Yay. you. And Landon Wicker. Happy birthday to Yay. you, buddy. Happy Yay. birthday. We That's have awesome. some youth. We're gonna let Jesse and Cassie yes. do these. So we have uh, Lincoln Hadfield. Happy birthday, man. Happy birthday. And Caesar Maddox. Happy Caesar. birthday. Caesar. He's, he's flown Caesar. somewhere. He's here in the house, yeah. even. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's turning 17, so he should be able to buy stuff off infomercials. You Ooh, know, like that. all the things, yeah. Caesar. Like you can buy, buy you know, all, the all the knife sets. You buy one, and you get and one I for think free. You can and if you use order your parents the next one, card? you get two sets extra. I think that's how it works. The parents' credit card. How do you know card, this? Right? Yes, because yes. yes, they always say like you have to be 17 or older to purchase. I thought it was 18, but... I mean, let's be honest. Like, I don't know. Maybe you have this the sweet is one of Jesse's rebellious 18, sides. So 17, you gotta you got to have something. So might as well I buy just, stuff I up picture in Jesse at Jesse's house. I picture his parents <laughs> calling up. Our kid is not 17 <laughs> years old yet, okay? No, we are not keeping this $1,000 worth of knives. We don't it was need $20. That bad. You guys had to call in the next 30 minutes. It's $20. Yeah, for the next Month. 20 months, yeah. it's $19. <laughs> it's deceiving. It is. Oh, so That's why you have to be fun. smart enough. That's why you can't do. So, so Caesar, no, Caesar, be smart enough. <laughs> Caesar's like, I don't know what I'm doing here. What's happening? Okay, I get to do the uh, adults' birthdays, the more mature people who do not order. We don't know uh, if they order things online. <laughs> well, I, was, I know, I was going to say not order online, but but uh, everybody nice orders try, online. Nice try. Nice try. I think a three-year-old can it's order fine. online now, right? I mean, it doesn't all I you mean, do I'd is... I mean, I'd kill my son dead if he did. You can, you can like, via Alexa, you <laughs> can add one. it to your shopping cart and just That's buy it true. with the yeah. click of a it's nothing. That's true. <laughs> okay, this other birthdays. Topic of Lane conversation. Pitts, happy, happy birthday Lane. coming birthday. up this week. <laughs> Aaron Valim, happy oh, birthday this week, too. And Janet Sullins this week. Happy birthday. Again, if you know these people, reach out and give them a shout out. Happy birthday. Not on Facebook, but in some sort of other message. Some That's sort of rule. real. Yeah, you could use the phone even. What? Call. Yeah. Wait, do you not know. use your phone for face? 
for voice? For Facebook, no. Yeah. No. Does anybody <laughs> use their phone for voice calls anymore? Is that what yes. it's called? A voice Actually, call? Actually, this Do is funny. Call? A I voice called, call. I called Dana earlier this week, and she was like, hello? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know Just how to, text hello. text me. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy. Oh. So, Jesse and Cassie are here. Yeah, You guys here. have officially started yes. as youth yes. directors. Yes. So, uh, how has life been going? What's been happening? been really good um this week was the first week i got to lead both middle school and high school mm -hmm. and i gotta be honest with you it was fantastic yeah um, there were uh new kids in both of them and nice. uh it was a blast man it's the middle schoolers are as full of all the energy as they can be um yes. and so it's and if you guys don't know what the box of mystery is find yes. how how to ask a middle schooler they that's the best yeah. part is the box yes. of mystery yes and so we had a blast so i'm I am stoked to roll into this first month as uh, as youth director here and see what God has planned and to plan some crazy events and uh, do some crazy things and um, just bring these kids to Jesus. So I'm I'm, awesome. I'm stoked. Yay! Awesome. What so so what have you been doing the rest of this week? Did you do something this weekend? I did. I did. So I went to Eastern Washington uh, with a couple buddies, uh, Dana's husband mm -hmm. um, and another guy. And uh, who was the other guy? Jeff Ramirez. There you go. And my um, son. And Eugene, my, yes, my three-year-old son. It was guys was he only on a camping. Yes, it was a dudes-only camping trip. And, and my dad came. Abby and mommy can't come because it's boys-only mommy. <laughs> oh, so. does he have his own bike yet? <laughs> He's a little e-bike. I don't know if you brought it. He did. He did. he did, and he put miles on that bike. Yeah, nice. Um, so yeah. What yeah. happened yeah. to your head? Yeah, what happened well. to your head, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, can we get a close-up of that He's on the camera? A we, need, we need like a close-up of that. Don't hold in on that. Hold, don't hold, hold in on that. Jesse, don't hold hold that. It's not a prideful <laughs> moment of mine. <laughs> I'm beaming oh, I'm with pride to see over how here. This looks. I love this. Okay, what happened to your head? You have uh, to tell the people. Tell us the story. So I ride what they call trials, and it's a technical type of dirt biking. You do obstacles, hill climbs, things like that. Well, let's just say I didn't make it up one of the big rocks this weekend, and the bike came tumbling down, and I put a handlebar to the forehead. <laughs> And oh, without failing, uh, Tucker, after I get down to the bottom, he laughs and goes, huh, you're on camera tomorrow morning. <laughs> 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 and so, sure enough, I've got this big old welt right there. And uh, yeah. So, so we realized that we can't quite call it a motorcycle accident. It wasn't that oh, major no. of an accident, right, where everything. So was, this was more a riding faux pas. <laughs> Oh. Can you spell that for us, please? We figured out how to spell faux pas. We tried to earlier because we were so, like, I was writing notes down, the faux pas stuff. How do you spell faux pas? Faux pas. Uh, it's a faux pas. Do people faux even pas. say faux pas anymore? Yes, oh, I think do. that's still you a word. Do. Okay. Yeah, we do It's here. still we're a word. We all do. So we say things like classy. that. Classy. That's it's right. I'm now classy Cassie, in case you need oh. to know. Okay, classy oh. Cassie. So what have you been doing this week? So he um, went away at motorcycle This week riding. I started work, and yep. I work nice. at Starbucks, and I'm not new to Starbucks or anything. Like, I've kind of been, you know. Around a I've while. been there for a while. 13 years. She knows 13, but right. thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I thought you said 15. I said 13. Oh, you're so sweet. 13. There you go. There's the bike. Um, yeah, oh, so you. 13 years, but I started at my What Starbucks fifth, you got? Uh, the one in Kenmore. Kenmore. Yeah, nice. so right by Kenmore Lanes, which check it out if you haven't it's been. It's <laughs> um, But, yeah, uh, it was awesome. It's been really great. I'm, cool. I'm getting getting my feet wet there, and we'll see what happens. She makes nice. some good coffee, so swing nice. on Did by. you do anything else fun then while the boys were away? You know, um, I got a pedicure this weekend. Oh. Uh, or earlier this week. It's yeah, we went the this weekend. Okay. We went this week. <laughs> we did. We got um, a pedicure. Yeah, Dana and I both got pedicures. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Did you get a pedicure too, Jesse? Yeah, I thought week? about it, and she tried to bribe me, but... I just, I didn't have the time. <laughs> How? I didn't have the time. What a bummer. Yeah. Too busy Such with my new job. And you don't need a manicure anymore if you're not working on cars all day Yeah, long. my hands Your are clean. No are more diesel beautiful. oil underneath the nails. Man, what am I going to do? They're going to get soft. Uh, <laughs> go smooth skin. Rough them up. Go maybe play with maybe we should have a maybe we should have a guys weekend to go out and get like pedicures. Ooh, oh, oh, my I don't think Jesse would do that, but you oh. might find I'll other be busy people. that weekend doing something else. Faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the back. Faux pas. Stop talking. Faux pas. Somebody what do you mean? <laughs> that sounds like a fun time, right? I mean, for the for me. Can yeah. we come? Because <laughs> I'll go with that. I'll go to that. You know what, though, guys? If you want to get one. 
fine. Trent's get your it. guy. You all can go get <laughs> Call one. him up. I got go a nail. Let me just tell you, I got a nail that's killing me, though, that I could wish I could do something <laughs> with. You know, it's one of those that, like, it ripped off, and it was, like, Caesar. it's down too far, oh, and no. it catches on everything, <laughs> and it's, oh, so no. it's rough. Even right now, my wife said I need, like, a buffer that, like, thing or something. I don't know what to do. Yeah. But, like, it's I called keep a nail file. Yeah, or well, I tried a nail file, and a nail file didn't work. The nail file just still makes it rough and everything. I'm surprised you could join us this morning. I don't know if the nail place would help that or not? I don't know if they can help you. Or if you. they'd use that cheese grater on it and then it would just make it worse, oh, right? That's the worst thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> Did they do I, that? I don't know. I would never, I don't know well, about that. Okay. Let's nails. talk about events. Let's talk about Speaking events Speaking of, of events. doing yeah. nails and getting a pedicure and a manicure, <laughs> I think the youth has some stuff they're doing, right? <laughs> we are not doing pedicures <laughs> and manicures. Oh, oh, I've got nothing. I don't know. You middle schoolers are really excited about that. but <laughs> I heard Jesse is going to do a junior high all-nighter. Stop for, talking. For this three is not nights all at the time. Maddox house. And they are they hosting. Are Trent's going to stay up the entire time. For all the junior high kids. Yes. I'm going to try to rein this back okay. in for a second. Yes. This is not happening. Thank you. Jesse, please tell us what's coming. What up. events do we have? So I'm pretty excited. Um, I know this week is spring break for middle school and high school here in the Valley. Uh, so what we decided to do was this Friday. April 16th, we're doing a movie night at my our house or my parents' house. Don't tell them they're out of town. Ooh. Party at the Estrins. Party at um, the Estrins. Yes. So there's movie and food Friday night. I'll have more details on Is that gonna this week. Is there going to be a week. DJ there, too? No, definitely oh. not. But thanks for asking. Okay. I mean. What what age is it you said? High school? High school. Okay. And then. Uh, Wait, what age? I'm joking. Trent, you're not invited. I'm joking. Okay, <laughs> high school. We got it. Your son is, though, but not you. We got it. Friday. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you can go have your pedicure that day. They get that, sorry, they get that info online? Uh, yes, I'll have Perfect. more info this week and uh, set it up on the social media and on the website. And, and, so. Oh, hey, so I remember we were talking something earlier. Uh, if, if parents, uh, you've got an email list, right? Yes. And been sending some of this info out. I don't know if you sent this info out or not yet. But not yet. If, they, if they're not getting emails from you, what do they need to do? Yeah, they just need to contact me. and uh, uh, You have your email your here email? yet? It is jesse at imrc.org. J-E-S-S-E. Yes, no, no I. Oh, I. No J-E-S-S-E. I. S-S-E. That's actually yes. one of the mm. things that makes him really mad is if yes. you put an I in there. Yes. So don't do that. But if you are in high school and you are watching this, you are invited. Yes. I write you your name. Are I write your name with an I all the time. So. I know. He knows he's, he's over it. So if you're emailing him, if you want to get on this as a parent or as yes. a student, want to get the info from youth, mm-hmm. you yes. can start email Jesse and he will make sure you get a part yes. of that. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to have you on that list anyways just for future mm-hmm. events or any updates um, on what we're talking about or camps or whatnot. I'd love to be able to be in contact with you guys um, all the time. So, <laughs> What do we have going on for middle school? And then middle school, April 23rd. So not this upcoming Friday, but the one after. We are going bowling. And what day um, is that? Ooh. That is April 23rd of Friday. Ooh. So we bowling. are bowling again. and pedicures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Trent, enough with the pedicures. There won't Just be bowling. Any pedicures. Bowling Don't and worry pizza about it. sounds a little better, I'll right? They wear those bowling <laughs> shoes. Yeah, those stinky bowling shoes. <laughs> then you get to give them a pedicure. That is awesome. We need to zoom what are we going to do with Trent? Shut off his mic. What yes. are we going to do? That one right there. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, bowling. and I'll have more details on that <laughs> so cost, sorry. time, whatnot, but uh, I'm pretty stoked. We've got four lanes reserved up at Snoqualmie uh, Bowling Facility. If you haven't been there, Place is awesome. Lower it's your expectations, <laughs> and then you're gonna have and so much fun. It's a yes. piece of history. Yes. I think, right? yes. Yes. Know, but. yes. If you're a good bowler, the lanes aren't level, so it's just it's it's a guess of where it's gonna go. But it is fantastic. Is that from all those people that have lobbed the ball? Yes. You ever done that? I've, yes. I shouldn't say because yeah. No. Anyways, <laughs> Trent has no Go experience back. Yeah, no, no experience. <laughs> None. Not those pedicures. <laughs> Um, that is sweet. <laughs> that is cool. So that is exciting that, that uh, we get some stuff happening for junior yes. high <laughs> and high school and everything. And um, I know the other thing, you guys have just kind of still, you've been living at your parents' house, right? Yes. Because they live here. Yes. And um, But you're looking for a house. We are. Mm-hmm. And that can be a big prayer request, I think, that we're praying for, right? It is. Yes. It is. Tell um, us kind of what you're looking for, maybe. Well, we have our dreams, but we also know that dreams don't always come true <laughs> when it comes to houses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we, uh, but we we are very much a uh, ministry from our house type couple. Mm-hmm. So we love to, our house in Montana was a revolving door with students, family, friends. Um, and so we want to be able to have a place where we can host, where we can have the youth over yeah. for an all-nighter if we need um, <laughs> and whatnot. Trouble and uh, pancakes. And so we are definitely hoping for something that we can host in. And then um, part of our story is going to be adoption and foster care. So mm-hmm. 
a house that we can, uh, what's the word? Grow um, your family? Be approved in, mm. or because uh, mm. you have to go through home studies and whatnot, and so it's a house that is so safe. So it can't be so condemned. It can't be dilapidated. No, it can't be condemned. <laughs> it has to be, be livable. Um, and whatnot. So just a house like that, I mean, we love property. I grew up on a little farm, so property is always great. And I'm a mechanic, so a shop is always a bonus. <laughs> um, and uh, But we do know that we use... They like it, white picket fence. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, wraparound porch, sold. Um, <laughs> that is very much my style. But just something that we can do ministry out of. Our mm-hmm. house in Montana yeah. was very much a revolving yeah. door. Um, the garages were used all the time by uh, youth students or families in the church, and I love that we love that Mm -hmm. um so something we can be a blessing back to this community and we just it's awesome bringing people in and having them over for dinner or watching a movie or playing games or whatever it is so something we can do that so we are definitely praying for a home um as soon as we get a house we're going to start the adoption of foster care approval process Mm -hmm. um i'm sure there's a different word for that i can't remember what you're doing great um but so we know that as soon as we get there. So we're just we're praying and hoping for a house, um, somewhere we can call home. So. Yes. So, so please pray along yeah. with us. Yeah. Yes. Be, be doing that. Pray. Be praying for them. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's a, we were joking. Yeah, we just need a non-condemned house like in the Duval area <laughs> under a million dollars. That alone right? is like a miracle. Okay. <laughs> no, but seriously, maybe maybe uh, you have connections with people that yeah. you know are going to sell, yes. or who knows how God works through these crazy yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. But um, we're we're just hoping for an awesome miracle for that, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, that will yeah, help too. continue ministry and just bless you guys and keep you settled here so mm-hmm. that is awesome um and uh we're about to go into our worship time but before that just to kind of set that up you know we're coming the week after easter and easter right is sometimes is such a high and oh man easter and we celebrate that stuff and then sometimes do you guys ever like you know they hear the saying like oh we put christmas away or oh we put the easter away and, and kind of that <clears throat> symbolic of like oh we a lot of people too we just stop thinking about it easter is done mm-hmm. and we kind of stop and um but how do we keep that same hunger and attitude of becoming more like christ and <clears throat> Not just about becoming like a better, healthier person, like we were right. talking about Lent, yeah. right. but because yeah, I love this little saying, it's not about what you give up, it's about who you become. And we want to become more like, like who? Like Jesus. Like Jesus. Way to go, Dana, right? <laughs> so one ga- great way to keep doing that is just reflecting on what God has accomplished mm-hmm. through his resurrection and on that Easter day, what he did. We're going to sing the song that we've been learning called Great Things, and it, it, you know, it talks about God doing great things. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I think of great things, what great things God has done. Sometimes we, we think about, and I do like, okay, some of the big things he's done in our life. Like, you know, God provided a job for us, or maybe God helped us find our spouse or, or, or find a house or something like that. Um, and maybe a specific big prayer, like, of, oh, he did this great thing. Or maybe even you felt like you had this big prayer and God didn't answer your prayer. And you're yeah. like, God, man, you didn't. Well, man, he's not doing great things. But I want us to get our eyes off of those things for a bit and see the eternal things that God has done for us. And more specifically, what he did through his resurrection and what he accomplished for us. And I want you to think about these things that God did because of that Easter Sunday in these great things. So we have some some verses here these guys are going to read as we get ready to go into worship. Go for it, guys. Yes. Man, he redeemed us and forgave us our sins, and he saved us by his grace. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. He rescued us from darkness, and he brought us into his kingdom. Colossians 1, 13. He made us righteous. Romans 5, 19. He freed us from condemnation. Romans 8, 1. He freed us from the law. Oh, just kidding. He freed us from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. He made us alive with him, Ephesians 2, 5. He made us a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He gave us the gift of eternal life, which is Romans 6, 23. And he provided love for us that is so strong that nothing in this world could separate us from it, Romans 8, 38 through 39. And now we're just going to go into this time of worship. And we talked about last week kind of getting your family involved and standing up and singing together and just we... We recognize that it's awkward and that you might feel like, oh, I don't have the greatest voice or I sound silly or I don't know, but do it anyways because remember that you are singing to Jesus and he gave his all for you. And just stand up and as you sing together, just remember who you're singing to and why. I mean, he's done all these things for us. So find your way and your family's way to worship together as we sing these songs. Stand up, clap, jump around if you've got kids, get them into it and just worship together. Thank you. 
Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. You have done great things, great things. All right, sing it out. Come, let us worship the King. Yes, come, let us bow at His feet. Oh, He has done great things. So see what our Savior has done. Yeah. See how His love overcomes. Oh, He has done great things. He has done great things. promises just inspire you as we think about those incredible things that God did because of his resurrection and encourages us to be more and more like him. May we decrease and he increase in our lives. Oh, the joy to be and joy to know it's when I decrease that you fill up my soul what a joy to see lord joy to hold it's when you increase god i want nothing more yeah. oh, in my hands 
for us. May it lead us and spur us on to just praise and lift up that mighty name of Jesus. Let's sing this little chorus out. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name. It's for eternity for all of us, Jesus, that you gave your life so that we might have life, and you gave life to us. You transferred that life to us, Jesus. God, may we have hope and passion to live for you and to be more like you a little bit each day, God. Help us to, to, to not ref, to think too hard on, on, on the things that that, you know, what we're doing or what we're not doing, but who we're becoming and becoming like, and that's like you, Jesus, to get, keep our focus on you. So help that passion, Jesus. Help that, that thought of Easter and that celebration to carry us on all our days, Jesus. 
thank you, God, for your love for us. Thank you for your greatness and majesty. We love you, Jesus, and pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for worshiping God this morning and just really connect with Him and thinking about Him. We hope you enjoy the rest of today's service. Church, great to be with you this morning. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pray in just a second here and get us ready for today. But before I do, quick reminder, great stuff we have as far as kids ministry stuff. So Miss Dana every week puts this great program together for our children. And so make sure you point your kids in that direction. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, just uh, want to remind you that we have notes in our app so you can kind of follow along with the passage we're in this morning as we are still slogging it out in the Gospel of Luke. And I want to pray for us this morning because... Uh, uh, you know, I find so often throughout this particular gospel, there are things that just deeply pertain uh, to our lives in the 21st century. And I think this week is no exception to that. And so I think it's great for us to just have our hearts settled for the spirit to do a work in our hearts so that we can be more like Jesus. So if you would join me right now, be fantastic. Jesus. I thank you that we are works in progress, but we are works in progress with great hope. And in that, that we have this confidence that you will carry us on to completion, that you will do the things in us that most glorify you in this world, and you will do the things in us that help us to most represent you in the way that you are best captured, that we will be a people of love and of sacrifice, people who take the truth and live it in our own lives as we then seek to sow grace in the world around us. So I pray this morning as we continue to look at this very unique day that you had and, and we see sort of some of the, the challenges that were before the people, I pray that we would take these things to heart and from that, uh, that we would all the more lean into you so that you would work in us. So Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We need you. And we really petition you now in your good name. Amen. All right, if you want to grab your bibles, we are in Luke chapter 11, and we're going to move from chapter 11, and we're going to press our way into chapter 12. Now, as we're doing that, I want to remind you, uh, because we've been in chapter 11 now for probably, I'm guessing, a month and a half, roughly, something like that. It's taken us a while to get through that chapter and into chapter 12, but in the context of the passage, this is a single day in the life of Jesus. So we've taken a month and a half, but this is still a single day in the gospel of Luke. And in this day, it was crazy. It was one of those ones that you want to put on a calendar and circle and be like, that one was nuts. All right. So here's how the day began. Jesus had taught his disciples how to pray, and then they are immediately kind of uh, engaged with a person that has a demonic spirit. And so Jesus does what Jesus does, and he casts out this spirit, which is proof that the kingdom of God has emerged, and he does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the onlooking crowd, they see this, and at first they are amazed, but then they sort of divide into factions, and they start to have different opinions on what Jesus is doing and what's unfolding. And so some in the crowd look and they say, well, Jesus, he didn't cast out demons by the power of God. Rather, he does it by the power of Satan himself. And Jesus is like, you guys are knuckleheads. That's dumb. A kingdom divided against itself. It's not going to stand. There's no way I'm doing this by the power of Satan. Then there's others in the crowd that said, well, we don't really care what power he's doing it by. Just do more power things like Jesus, do us a favor. Stop talking. Stop preaching. Just do more stuff that we can be wowed by. And so then Jesus from this looks at the entire crowd and he just calls them to the carpet. He just brings this smack down where he's like, you are the most evil of all the generations and all the history of Israel. And not just the crowds, but 
particularly he's looking at the religious leadership, this kind of religious industrial complex that controls the society. And he says, and you guys are so to blame for the problems. Now, what's crazy about that is no sooner does he, Jesus, do, do this call out of the crowds and the leaders that some of the leaders invite him to dinner, which I'm like, feels like a trap, bro, but he goes. And I love the fact that Jesus is always willing to engage his critics because I believe his heart is, uh, they might turn, they might change, they might realize the error of their ways. And so he goes to this dinner, but instantly he knows, no, this is just a setup, it's a trap. And so he tells the religious leaders, he says, here's your problem. You love the good book, but you have bad hearts. And when you have bad hearts, it actually corrupts the good book. And you think you're generous, but your generosity really just flows from your sense of greed. And you think you represent God and the law, but you do so at the cost of love and justice. And so all the way around, he says, you're broken. You are damaging the society and you're tarnishing the name and the reputation of God. You're supposed to hold the keys of the kingdom that saves, but instead you're just kind of locking everybody up in these locks that damn souls. He really has some serious things to say. In fact, he talks about the misery of this, gives this warning there at the table. He says in Luke chapter 11, verse 52, what sorrow awaits you, you experts in religious law, for you remove the key to knowledge for the people. You don't enter the kingdom yourselves and you prevent others from entering as well. And so I think this is one of those things that's so important because what he's getting at is that those who represent God, whether it's 2,000 years ago or it's today, if we represent God, but we are locking people up in their shame, in their sin, in their brokenness, in their problems, whatever it is, like if we're not giving solution, if we're not bringing grace, if we're not promoting gospel to people, we're just saying you're broken and sinful and wrong and against God, and we don't offer up anything that shows how God came to rescue, then we're no different than these leaders. And so Jesus' words here, when I look at these things, I go, wow, these are sobering words. Because if we lose sight of the fact that we are called to be ambassadors of God's life and love and grace and freedom that comes with the gospel, if we lose that and we just point out the problems of society or we get locked into the rules more than we focus on the relationship that Jesus came to restore, then we're just going down the same path as these leaders. And so Jesus' words, like I said, are sobering, unless you don't really like what he has to say, and then they're just irritating. And it's irritating that really seems to be more where these listeners kind of lock into. It says in verse 53, as Jesus was leaving, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees became hostile and tried to provoke him with many questions. They wanted to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. So basically what we have here is uh, these guys are kind of going like, okay, he made a point, but we don't like that he made a point. And so now we're going to try to pick apart everything he said. And so it's that whole thing of, well, what about this Jesus? And what about that? What do you think about this? What about in this scenario or in that circumstance? What would you say if this happened instead of that? I mean, they're just trying to trap him because they don't want to really submit to him. They don't want to submit to his word. They don't want to actually take uh, themselves to account and, and be like, man, maybe we should reevaluate and redeploy our lives in a different way. No, they're locked in their problems. They're locked in their bias. They're locked in their sin. And so they resent him more than they actually want to submit to him. And yet this is nothing new. Uh, I think about this even as a pastor for almost three decades now. I've seen it time and again where there is this sense in which we say, I love the Bible, but I don't always love to do everything that is in the Bible. I don't always want to submit myself to everything that is there, especially the really difficult things, the real self-sacrificing things. Those are the things I don't really want to do. So I want to say, I hold this up, but I don't always want to do this thing. And, and that's really what Jesus is dealing with with these leaders. They, again, are playing their own angle. They have their own agenda and they want to do their own thing. And so they love to defend the word of God, but they lack doing it. And so Jesus, he calls them out. And as he does so, he's struck a nerve. And if there's anything I know about this is when a nerve is struck, one of two things can happen. One is there's re-realization and then kind of a redeployment from that. So you're like, wow, uh, I see what the word says. I should do that and I need to go a different direction. That's what repentance is all about. It's a change of mind that results in a change of life and action. 
The other thing that can happen though when you're called out like this, when a nerve is struck, is there can be resentment and retaliation. And that's precisely where these individuals go. See, Jesus is trying to loosen them up from their religious sin. But all he's really done is bruise their self-righteous ego. That's the way they're feeling. And so they begin to sort of plot against him. They want to trap him in some way. But see, what's so good about this, I think, is the fact that what I realize is something Jesus said earlier. He said that he's come to divide. And in that, it said his word is going to be an agent of division. Some are going to hear his word and they're going to be changed. Others are going to hear his word and they're going to rebel against it. And that's the tension you're feeling right here. Again, they revere it until they actually have to do it. And so now his words are dividing hearts. Some hearts, they soften to the word. Other hearts, they harden when they hear the word. And these guys, they're hard. And not only are they hard, but now they're unhinged. And so they're going to use their influence and their power to try to derail Jesus's mission, right? They want to sabotage him, but Jesus, he knows it. So it says going into chapter 12, verse one, it says, meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. Jesus turned first to his disciples and then he warned them and he said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. Now, I I find this really interesting because here it is. There's this swelling crowd that's becoming so large and so dense. Literally, people are starting to like walk over each other. It's like this urgent situation where you're like, man, maybe we should disperse the crowd. Maybe we should kind of loosen up things a little bit because somebody's going to get hurt here. Like it feels urgent, just the scene. And yet for Jesus, what is more urgent than this crowd that's starting to crush themselves is this poison that he sees from the Pharisees. So before he even says, hey, crowd, back it up a little bit, he looks right at his disciples. He says, there's something even more important I got to tell you about. Watch out. Watch out for what's going on with the, the religious leaders. Watch out for the Pharisees. And he says here, it's the yeast of the Pharisees, and that yeast is their hypocrisy. Now, these are very vivid pictures, especially in their culture. So a hypocrite was literally a person who was an actor that would play a part. So a hypocrite would wear a mask and pretend to be one thing when they were really another thing, right? So that's pretty vivid. But then the other idea is this idea of yeast. And you understand yeast, you put it in some bread and it unlocks all of this gaseous kind of reaction. And from that, the dough swells and rises, but there's no substance. There's no weight really to that size. It just looks impressive, but there's not much to it. And that's what Jesus is highlighting as he thinks about these religious leaders. He says, they're just putting on a mask. They're just playing a part. They look like they have substance, but they have no weight to their character whatsoever. And see, this is really important because he's describing the inner lives of people. So you have some inner lives that are truly oriented toward God, that they truly want what God wants, that they are willing to surrender and submit themselves to what God desires, no matter the cost, no matter what it takes. But then there's others whose inner lives are about themselves. They may use God to get ahead. They may use the Bible to get ahead. They may use religion to get ahead, but it's really about them. And so one life, it's sincere. It is guided by God in such a way that you're going to be consistent and compassionate and Christ-like. It's going to have substance. It's going to have weight. It's going to have a sense of authenticity. But the other inner life, well, that's going to be one that's shaped by being critical, cynical, and self-righteous. It might claim to elevate biblical truth as long as it doesn't actually have to live according to the biblical truth when it is required of them. This is what hypocrisy is really all about. And if you think about it for a minute, our world understands this idea of hypocrisy. I mean, just honestly, if we think about it for a minute and we read articles or some books that have been written on this, we see that oftentimes the disbelieving world or the de-churched world, whatever kind of label we want to use, they sometimes look at the evangelical community and there's a couple of labels that get applied to us relatively often. One is that we're self-righteous or judgmental, right? So that's one of those. Man, you guys are just always judgmental against this group and that group and anybody doesn't see things your way. And so we get accused of being judgmental. The other thing we get accused of is being hypocritical. 
You say this, but you do that. You claim these values, but you don't live them out in your own life. And so these are the two sort of labels that kind of orbit around our evangelical circles, kind of this judgmental or self-righteous thing and this hypocritical thing. Now, if we're candid for a minute, all human beings are hypocritical and self-righteous. All human beings are. So I get that. I get that we might even look at other people and go, but what do you mean I'm a hypocrite? You're all, everybody's a hypocrite. True enough. But here's the thing about us as followers of Jesus. We need to be more self-aware because part of what this whole thing is about that we believe is that we've come to this realization that, yeah, I am sinful. Yeah, I am broken. And I've taken all of my flawed life and I've thrown it at the foot of Christ's cross. I've said, I know I can't do it. I know I'm unworthy. I know I'm broken. I know I go my own way. I do my own thing. I make my own rules. I've done it wrong. God, you're the only one that's ever done it right. Jesus, you are the solution for my sin problem. So I throw all of my life at you and there before the grace of God go I. Like that's what we claim and understand as Christians. And so from that, we should be the most aware of just how little good we really bring to the table as human beings. And from that, it should cause us to be not self-righteous, but incredibly humbled, not judgmental, but incredibly understanding, not hypocritical because we're trying to claim to be something we're not, but rather we just own that we are flawed people. And it is the grace and work of Christ that makes us whole. See, I think that realization, that's a powerful thing in our world when we just simply acknowledge that it's only his work, his grace, his strength, his life given to me, and I'm just a servant. I'm just humbled by his love for my life. See, that's the way we should operate. And in fact, I I would take this a step further. I think uh, the more maybe we we don't sound like we're judging our world, the more we don't sound self-righteous, I think even the accusations of hypocrisy would sort of drop because when there is a lot of judgment that comes out of us as followers of Jesus, as Christians, as there's maybe a lot of self-righteous tone, I think people tend to look at that and then they're all the more apt to want to call us hypocrites when we don't live up to the standard because in part, we're kind of communicating a sense of pride when we sound self-righteous or judgmental as though our poo doesn't smell. In reality, everybody's poo smells, right? And we know that. And so we should own that we're all sort of stinky, right? It's just kind of the facts of things. Now, maybe we don't see it. Maybe we won't own it. It doesn't matter because in the end, God sees it. And one day we will all see it too. And so Jesus speaks to this in verse two. He says, the time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to all. Ouch. Whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light. Whatever you've whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. And so all masks, they will come off. All true intentions will be revealed. All platitudes and all kinds of, you know, thoughts and everything we've ever done. It's going to be revealed in some way. We're going to realize the real nature of ourselves. And so our plank eyedness will be exposed. And we're going to see in the end if we were just yeasty gas or if we had substance, right? That's all Jesus is getting at in this. That's what he's getting at. And so it's a real sober warning in my mind, right? To be like, okay, so so as we're doing this life and as we're seeking to live like Jesus and follow Jesus again, we should be doing so with great humility, great care, great dependency on him, a great sense of awareness of, again, how we are reliant on him as opposed to maybe taking things in our own hands or becoming a little bit self-righteous and potentially from that hypocritical. Because at the core of all of that, at the core of hypocrisy, at the core of judgment is this real sinister thing that we all struggle with. I mean, I struggle with it. I don't want to make it sound like I'm pointing fingers. I'm not. I'm looking in a mirror and and seeing this in my own life, this own propensity, this propensity that exists in my own being. And it's this propensity for pride. See, pride is really the driver of hypocrisy. Pride is the the driver of self-righteousness. It's what gets in the way. But the question becomes, well, exactly how does that pride begin to play out? What are the ways that we can see that this is beginning to happen in some way? Because pride's going to go a couple of different directions. I'm going to point this out in a minute, but I want to go over to the board here for a second. 
We brought the uh, blackboard back for fun. And uh, a few weeks ago, when we were in the Gospel of Luke, I was talking about how Jesus talks about the good eye and the bad eye, good heart, bad heart, as it relates to the good book. And what our job is, this is the, the positive way to see things right here. Our job is to say, you're right, God's given us his word. And our lives are sort of an ambassador between the word and the world. And the word is to inform us the stuff we like in the word, the stuff we don't like in the word, right? So all the Sermon on the Mount is to inform our lives. We're to say, I'm in submission to this. So this informs me. And once it's informed me, then I can engage in the world the way Jesus wants me to. I'm going to live like I'm supposed to live, love like I'm supposed to love, forgive like I'm supposed to forgive, all of those kinds of things. That's how I'm supposed to live. That is a humble state. I am submissive to the word, the word works in me, and then that works out in the world through my life. That's Jesus's mission. But the way this can break down for us is kind of one of two ways. One is where instead of the word informing my life, I let the world inform my life, right? So I let the ebb and the flow and the feel and, you know, wherever it's going is where I'm going to go, wherever it puts pressure, then I'm going to go ahead and, and move with the pressure that's applied. And so the word world informs me. And then from that, I look at the word and it's sort of like give or take, do or don't do, pick some, drop others, whatever else. That's the way it's going to work because the world is really informing my life. And then this just becomes sort of optional content depending on the circumstance. And that's one way in our pride, we let the world rule us. The other way that this happens in our pride is that we in and of ourselves become the, the chief authority. And this is really what the Pharisees were doing. So they had their, their own version of religion. And then from that, with a bad eye, they looked at the good book. And they used the good book then as a weapon against the world. So here, this is just sort of optional. But here, it's sort of an attacking element. And so they would use the Bible to judge the world all the time. But they wouldn't use it to judge their own lives in the same way. Both of these or functional pride. This, like I said, is submission. It's humility. The Bible directs me in the world. These others or anything other than the Bible is directing me in my relationship to the world, either as a weapon or just as an optional tool for good wisdom that might fit when I need it. That's always the risk. And so Jesus, he's trying to warn us of these things because at the core of even this issue, more than pride, is fear. These things are actually driven by fear that then drives pride, where this is driven by something altogether different. So in verse four, Jesus speaks to fear. He says, dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They can't do any more after that. He says, I'll tell you whom you should fear. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. It's like, wow, I got heavy fast. You know, it's like, man, Jesus got deep really quick. But here's the thing he's getting at. Pride is a weird thing because it is driven by fear. And it's weird in that it comes out in two different ways. See, this one right here, this idea is fear of being rejected. right? And so you, you go, the, the world's let me know what the standards are. Uh, I don't want them to reject me or not like me or not accept me. And so from that, this becomes kind of give or take optional, depending on how I need to do it. This other one though, isn't fear of being rejected and want to cave to the world. This is fear of being rejected by the world. So you preemptively feel you need to attack your potential attackers. You need to be afraid of the persecutors. And so you try to take preemptive action against the persecutors before they can persecute you, right? Both of these are just fear of being rejected. This one says, I bow a knee. And this one says, I raise a fist. But they're still the same thing. It's fearing people more than it is fearing God. And this is why Jesus then says, here's the deal. You need to fear God more than people, which is kind of a freaky prospect, but it's really the thing we're meant to do. Yet what I love about this is no sooner does Jesus say, hey, you need to fear God, that then he kind of soothes our heart and he soothes our soul. And he says, but you know what? God cares about you. It's not just like be terrified of God. 
No, he's like, God cares about you, so your fear should make you realize his deep care for you as well. He says in verse 6, what is the price of five sparrows? This is two copper coins, correct? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Now, for some of us, that hair numbering thing isn't all that comforting, but it's okay. Because the ultimate comfort in this is seen. There's this paradoxical idea that when you fear God, it calms all other fears. It drives out all of that sense of terror of the world around us. If we legitimately fear God, what it means is we know that God cares for us. He's looking out for us, and therefore we'll be committed to whatever it is he's called us to be committed to. In that paradoxical, strange way, fearing God drives out all other fears. And so Jesus is bolting this all together saying, yeah, fear God. But in doing so, man, you're going to have great peace. You're going to have great calm. You're going to have great hope. In fact, There was a quote I read from a man named James Edwards, and he's talking about this passage. He says, human destiny is not determined on the anvil of fear, but in the tender hands of God's grace. For although God is the one who should be feared, the character of God is such that one need not fear him. All humanity associates God with the characteristics of mighty glory, judgment, In these verses, Jesus reveals another and perhaps even deeper insight into the divine, the intimacy and tenderness of God who cherishes humble creatures like sparrows and who attends to the insignificant details of things like the hairs of our heads. See, I think this is so good because what it's saying is, you know what, if you just zero in on the fact that God has your best in mind, And what God has called us to is the best we can live by and the best things that we can do if we understand that. And we don't fear the world around us, fear that it's going to persecute us or fear in a way that we need to bow our knee to it. If we just say, no, I'm going to fear God. And from that, I'm going to have courage from God. Jesus is like, then you're going to be secure. You're going to to face life a whole lot better under those conditions, right? Doing his will and his way by his mercy and his grace, right? Again, like I said, not by caving to the world, not by combating the world, but by seeking to be loyal to the way of Jesus. Jesus goes on to say this in verse eight. He says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the son of man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. But anyone who denies me here on earth will be denied before God's angels. Now, this is again, another one of these sobering things that Jesus says, but keep the context in mind. What's the threat that works against us when it comes to confessing Christ? Well, in this context, it's the threat of religion. It's the threat of the yeast of the Pharisees. It's the threat of hypocrisy, right? And so what he's saying is, if you're going to claim Jesus, then actually live out what Jesus calls you to do. That's the only way to avoid hypocrisy. That's the only way to not veer into the lane of pride that stands against the world or pride that bows to the world. The only way we can avoid that any of those kinds of things, is that in acknowledging Jesus, we're literally acknowledging Jesus. We're acting on the knowledge of Jesus. That's what acknowledge means, to act on what we know. And so Jesus says, you know what? You're really going to be um, acknowledging me publicly, not simply by saying, well, I believe in Jesus, or I go to church, or I'm a Christian. Really what he's getting at is we acknowledge him by following him. We acknowledge him by obeying him. We acknowledge him by doing what he calls us to do. Not because we're trying to earn our salvation, but rather because we're so grateful for the salvation that he earned for us. And from that, we know that life is better with Jesus when we're doing things according to his way, according to his will, and according to his wishes. That's how we acknowledge him. We hear and we do. From this, Jesus then kind of rounds things out with a very curious addendum. He says, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time what needs to be said. Now, I I, I bolted these two together. You might go like, how do those have a relationship to one another? But, But if you notice there, there's two references to the Holy Spirit. Right? So one reference is a sober warning and the other is a soothing promise. And Jesus puts these two together. 
Now, as to the warning, uh, people look at the first part of that and they go, what's this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And have I done that? And am I saved? And uh, can I never be saved if I blasphemy the Holy Spirit? And what's it mean, Pastor Matt? I need to know now. Here's the deal. Nobody really knows what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit quite is, right? We take some stabs at it here and uh, we kind of get a sense of it. But if we try to shrink it down to the context, it seems that what Jesus is pointing at is when the religious leaders saw him cast out a demon through the power of the Holy Spirit and then said, that Holy Spirit spirit power is satanic. It's like this idea that says, you know what, when you see the work of the Holy Spirit active and present, if your heart is so hard, you attribute that to the devil, it shows a hardness that is just kind of beyond gone, right? And that might be a little bit of what Jesus is getting at. I think another way maybe to look at this a little bit more applicationally is it's just disbelief. Like when you're in a state of open disbelief, it's not forgivable because you're in a state of disbelief. You're not asking to be forgiven. You're not seeking to be redeemed in any way. So when there is that hardness that says, I don't want God, I'm not interested. I don't seek his power, his promises, his provision, nothing. I don't want it. That's sort of that state of just, man, you're, you're hard. But even in that, For all of us, Jesus says, you know, but I'm offering life. I'm offering forgiveness. And if we have that recognition, we see that sin, we turn, he rescues, he redeems, he saves. That's his promise. And so this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit might have been something that was more pertinent to them in that day, seeing the work of the Spirit and rejecting it than it is for us. But it just reminds us that any perpetual disbelief is going to be a problem. And therefore, we want to submit it to God and really just turn to him in such a way that he forgives, he rescues, and he saves. So that's that first thing, that warning that he gives about the Spirit. But then in this, he also gave a promise about speaking from the Spirit. So earlier he said, don't fear people. But now he says, and don't fret when people corner you. Don't fret when people want to persecute you. Don't fret about what you're supposed to say or what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to act because the Spirit is going to handle that right? He's going to give you what you need. One of the great promises of scripture is the Holy Spirit, when we are in that place, and if we're submitting our lives to him, we're not bowing or fighting against the world, but rather we're submitting to the spirit. He will stiffen our spine. He will give us the right words. And a great thing he loves to do is also work in the hearts of other people on the other side of this. And some people that are very hard, one minute can be softened and another simply by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so there's this comfort and and conviction that says, you know what? He's got it covered. I just need to rely on him, seek him out, trust him. And when those times come, he's going to give me what I need. So again, I don't need to take a knee and bow to the world. I don't need to raise a fist against the world. I simply need to trust Christ, rely on the spirit, submit to him, and be really an ambassador that he can use me so that I might go out and reach the world. Let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus... I thank you for sober reminders, sober warnings. I thank you that you are always doing a work in us and you are doing it by your grace. And I pray that we will see the great value of doing things your way, of following your word and your will as you see fit. And we would do it with your tone, with your heart. We see that you were a friend of sinners. We see that you care for the least of these. We see uh, there was this truth where people were like, I want to be near Jesus because he is lowly and hard and we find rest for our souls when we are near him. May we be like that. May we not be the toxin of religion. May we not be the hypocrites or the self-righteous, but rather we would realize just how, how really broken we were and you rescued us so that you might change us and live through us so that we might then touch other people's lives as well. And so Jesus, we look to you to be our grace and our strength. May you be our fortification and may we be light in your name. May people see our good works and give you glory because you do it through us. We thank you and praise you, Jesus, in your good name. Amen. Amen. Sing this little chorus just as a prayer as we wrap that thought up. Christ in me. May the world see that. To come and empty me so it's you I breathe. I want my life to be Christ in me. So I will fix my eyes as you're my source of life. I want the world to see only Christ.
Christ in me. Come and empty. So come and empty me. So it's you I breathe. I want my life to be only Christ in me. I will fix my eyes. You're my source of life. I want the world to be only Christ in me. love again to speak a blessing over you and your family right now. This is just your chance to receive. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace in all that you do. Have a fantastic week this week. Enjoy the amazing weather. High schoolers, don't forget Friday, movie night at the Estrens. No pedicures. Okay. Have a fantastic week. You guys are loved. You are sent out there to share God's hope and love with the world around you. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.